Hip fractures are a very common cause of hospital admissions, particularly in the elderly population. Let's discuss the basics of hip fractures. The major risk factors for patients developing hip fractures include increasing age and osteoporosis. This is why hip fractures are much more common amongst the elderly population. It's also much more common amongst women compared to men. The usual mechanism of injury is a fall from a standing position. So another risk factor would be patients who have a tendency to fall, for example, if they have some form of visual impairment. Smoking and steroid use are also risk factors for hip fractures. Patients who have metastatic cancer are also at risk of developing hip fractures because if the cancer metastasizes to the bones, then this can lead to a pathological fracture. High energy trauma is also another important risk factor, and this is usually the mechanism of injury in younger patients presenting with hip fractures. In terms of the clinical features of hip fractures, patients will have pain on the affected side. They will also have a reduced ability to weight bear on the affected side. They will also have reduced or limited range of motion on the affected side. And if the fracture is significantly displaced, then the leg can be shortened and externally rotated. Hip fractures can be classified into many different types. And to understand this classification system, we need to first understand the basic anatomy of the hip joint and the proximal femur. Let's label the key aspects of this diagram. This label here is the head of the femur. The head of the femur articulates with the pelvis at the acetabulum, which is labeled here. So the head of the femur and the acetabulum form the hip joint, which is a ball and socket joint. When we talk about hip fractures, we are generally referring to fractures of the neck of the femur, which is labeled here. Fractures of the neck of the femur are particularly dangerous because the neck of the femur lacks a periosteal layer and is bathed in synovial fluid. So its healing potential is much reduced compared to the rest of the femur. Other important points to note is the greater trochanter located here and the lesser trochanter located here. This line here represents the approximate position of the edge of the joint capsule of the hip joint. This position will be very important to when we come on to classifying hip fractures. It's also important to understand the blood supply to the femoral head because it's also very clinically relevant. The femoral head receives blood from the medial and lateral circumflex vessels. It also receives blood from the superior and inferior gluteal arteries. So the femoral head has a very rich blood supply. And if there is disruption to the blood supply to the femoral head, it can lead to avascular necrosis which is very dangerous. Let's now go into detail of the different types of hip fractures. Here is the line showing the approximate position of the edge of the joint capsule again. The area of the hip proximal to this line will be inside the joint capsule, hence this area will be called intracapsular. The area of the hip distal to this line will be outside of the joint capsule, hence it will be called extracapsular. This is a really important distinction to understand because this is the main way hip fractures are classified. So hip fractures are either classified as intracapsular or extracapsular. I told you earlier that the head of the femur has a very rich blood supply. It's important to realize that those blood vessels run through the neck of the femur, which is intracapsular. So a key point to learn is that intracapsular fractures have a higher risk of developing disruption to those blood vessels compared to extracapsular fractures. And hence, intracapsular fractures have a higher risk of avascular necrosis compared to extracapsular fractures. We can further classify the location of hip fractures. If we section out the hip into different areas. If a fracture occurs in this area, it's called a subcapital fracture. If a fracture occurs in this area, it's called a transcervical fracture. Subcapital fractures and transcervical fractures are both intracapsular fractures. If a fracture occurs in this area, it's called a basicervical fracture. Now, basicervical fractures are located very close to the edge of the joint capsule. And remember, this black line is just an approximate position. So basicervical fractures can be located inside the capsule or outside the capsule. So basicervical fractures are either intracapsular or extracapsular. If a fracture occurs in this area, it's called a intertrochanteric fracture, as it is between the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter. Intertrochanteric fractures are extracapsular fractures. If a fracture occurs in this area, which is below the lesser trochanter, it's called a subtrochanteric fracture. And subtrochanteric fractures are extracapsular fractures as well. So we've discussed the basic principles of classifying the different types of fractures. There's another classification system used to determine the severity of intracapsular fractures. Let's take a closer look at the hip. We will now discuss the Garden's classification of hip fractures. So this classification system is used to categorize the severity of intracapsular fractures. It does this by determining the degree of displacement due to the fracture. Depending on which type of Garden's fracture it is, it can help guide the management options for the patient. The trabecule of the bone can also be used to differentiate between the different types of Garden fractures. Trabecule are areas of condensed bone which align themselves along the lines of stress of the bone. Here is a schematic representation of the trabecule. Please remember, this is just a schematic representation made purely for your understanding, and it does not truly represent the anatomy of the trabecule.
Let's go into detail of the different types of gardens fractures. Let's start with a type 1 gardens fracture. This is what a type 1 fracture could look like. So this fracture is incomplete and there is no displacement. Let's look at the trabecule. This is what the trabecule would look like. So the trabecule above the fracture line are more vertical. We also say there is valgus impaction with this type of fracture because the femoral head is in a more upright position. A key point about this type of fracture is that there is a low risk of avascular necrosis because it's an incomplete fracture and there's no displacement. Let's now look at a type 2 gardens fracture. So this is what the fracture could look like. So this is a complete fracture, but there is no displacement. If we look at the trabecule, this is what they'd look like. So they're all in line. This is because the fracture impaction is equal all the way across the bone. With this type of fracture, again, there is a low risk of avascular necrosis because there is no displacement. Let's now discuss a type 3 gardens fracture. So with this type of fracture, there is clearly a complete fracture, and the head of the femur is tilted. There is clearly displacement, but it's not all the way, so there is incomplete displacement. Let's have a look at the trabecule. So this is what the trabecule looked like, and we can see that the trabecule of the fractured bone become aligned more horizontally. With the type 3 fracture, there is a high risk of avascular necrosis because there is displacement, and it's a complete fracture. Let's now discuss a type 4 gardens fracture. Here is a normal hip, and here is a type 4 gardens fracture. So there is a complete fracture and there is complete displacement. Another important point here is that the head of the femur is in its normal anatomical position and articulating with the acetabulum normally, but the femur is shortened and externally rotated. So this is when patients with hip fractures will present with a shortened and externally rotated leg. Let's now compare the trabecule. So this is what they normally look like, and this is what they look like in a type 4 garden fracture. So in a type 4 garden fracture, the trabecule remain parallel to each other, but they do not line up exactly. This is because the femur is shortened. Another key point about a type 4 garden fracture is that it has a high risk of avascular necrosis because it is completely displaced.